Welcome back to the Energy Week podcast, Ryan Ray, alongside the wonderful Dr. Energy herself, Ellen Wald. Ellen, how's it going? Things are very, very good here. The Oil big, prices are low. They are low. So, you know. They are low. <laughs> they are too. They're a little low for my liking, to be quite honest with you. A um, little low for my, I usually don't follow the price, but now it's like, okay. Uh, <laughs> WTI is forty nine forty nine at the time of this recording. It's like, okay, you can just cross back over that 30, 50 threshold there. I'd feel a little bit better. There's something psychological in there. There is. There's a lot of psychological because like 49.97 versus 50.01 doesn't make a difference, but it's just like, I feel better. I feel better. Can you please just give me, give me 50.01? So Ellen, but the big question that I need to ask you is how much XFL football did you watch this weekend? Okay. So I did watch some XFL football. Very nice. I'm not going to lie. Very nice. We did did watch. Um, It was interrupted because we had to watch Celtics game. We had to watch them Priorities. beat Oklahoma. Yeah. Priorities. So yeah, we are we are huge Celtics fans oh, yeah. in this household. Like, like major Celtics fans. Like, watch every game. We so. watched. Um, I'm trying to think, they played Friday night and Saturday night. We watched one of those games. I can't remember. Which they one played was. Friday night and Sunday afternoon. The Sunday afternoon. So we watched the Friday night game. I guess it was. So we missed the Sunday afternoon game. So we watched the Friday night game. Um, but um, you know. Um, I, I will say this: the XFL I thought was fantastic. So there is our football update because we don't have any football updates, and and uh, the Celtics. Well, here's, well here's I hoping. hear that I hear that Tom Brady is be a pot, like a possibility hey, for hey, the Saints. Hey, I, well, what I, I think, well, maybe if you got that on my Twitter feed, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I'm serious. No, I, I was watching ESPN this okay. morning. Okay, well, they got off my Twitter feed. Then makes sense. Um, no, I, I, I you know, they, they, people said, well, the only reason Tom Brady would leave would to go to a contender, and Drew Brees has talked about retiring. It would only make uh, sense if Drew Brees retires for Tom Brady to go to the Saints because you've got a you got a Super Bowl ready team. You get to play in the dome for nine games a year at least because they play the Falcons plus their eight home games. So good weather, you know, not a great division. So. I, it's not talked about a lot. I didn't know ESPN is covering that now, so that's good to know. Oh, but, maybe uh, they were. I don't remember. They were talking about the Cowboys and I think the Saints. Yeah, I've I heard think the, they were talking about both. I've heard the Cowboys, Cowboys. too. So uh, we come on down to New Orleans uh, and uh, let's, you know, you can have two statues, a Drew Brees statue and a Tom Brady statue side by side. And, you know. Also, um, Mr. Manning. Senior, uh, yeah, sending, yeah, Manning Senior. So you can have three, three quarterbacks, three quarterbacks. So, uh, but anyways, let's get into what the people are here for, other than our awesome sports yeah. analysis, which is oil and gas and energy news around the world. We'll start with the New York Times via the Associated Press. Iraqi officials, U.S. will grant vital Iran sanctions waiver. Um, hey, look at that! I, like I, it. I caught it. I caught it. I caught it. Barely. Barely. I want to say Iran, but, I, I, but it, didn't, it didn't happen. So, Ellen, um, it's interesting because, just real quick, um, I, I, I tweeted this out the other day, and I got it from, I think, Anas, who had originally posted it from Reuters. Anyways, um, there's, right now, the if you remember, we, we had the Soleimani strike, and then we had the the attack on the base, and then you had the airliner get shot down. And I was watching, there's a video from Reuters about the people and the families, what they're going through, and how big of a pain, I mean, and I'm saying pain in the sense of um, just how difficult it is for them to get down to Iran, get compensation, you know, they have house notes and mortgages, and I, I was really, I hadn't even thought about all that, so, um, and it feels like everything's kind of simmered down, and so here you see that the, um, that the U.S. government is giving the Iranians a, a waiver, and it's like, you know, I'm not a big sanctions guy, but that would be the one time where I would say that, you know what, let's go ahead and slap some sanctions on some folks until there's a lot of checks handed over from the Iranians over to the to the families of those uh, victims of those families. So, um, so let me unpack some of these issues because there's there there's definitely some stuff going on here, um, you know, beyond that. So mm-hmm. the waiver is so they they've already given the waiver to Iraq to import this electricity from Iran. Essentially, that's what they're doing, gas and mm-hmm. electricity um, uh, from Iran, and so they're signaling now that they're going to they're going to extend this waiver. Now, the issue is, and apparently the entire reason why they're going to extend it is because Iraq has moved to show, has made fairly significant uh, movement in the past several months towards um, investing in its own natural gas electricity development. 
And so that's the only reason why they're getting this waiver extended is because they've actually, I think they've had a bunch of companies had, um, you know, have had um, like permits or whatever deals to develop Ira- Iraqi gas and, and build power plants and things like that. But there's been no movement, you know, they need like final approval and stuff. And so I think the Americans were basically pushing Baghdad to get on this, like, get moving on it and so finally they had to basically like hold the waiver over their head saying we're only if you don't get moving on this developing your own they have plenty of natural gas they don't need iranian natural gas and so i think it's significant in that is i don't see it as less of, as as much of like a giving in or or mm-hmm. they were holding it out for a very specific reason which was we want you to develop your own resources and you know you you need to get get going um, I would say like three months down the line, if these families don't have, then, then maybe the United States can can do that. But it doesn't seem like there's much that Iraq can do to pressure Iran. Mm. Although maybe there is, I, I don't I don't know. It's a really good question. I think um, there's someone I'd love to ask about this in DC who I think would have some really good insights. So mm. next time I talk to her, I am going to bring this up because I think that that that. I didn't see the situation the way that you saw it, but I think that's a really interesting perspective. And I'm going to ask her what, how she, she reads that because she might have some interesting insight. Into, yeah. Well, into if you that. just go back to the, the Trump administration and the rhetoric around Iran, um, there was, you know, sanctions and this, and, you know, if they attack us, that, 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 and, and there's you know, 170 people, I think were killed in that plane, something like that. 200 people were killed in that plane. And, you know, they had nothing to do with anything. They were just simply getting on a plane, going from A to B, and if you believe the Iranians and it was accidental, okay. If you don't believe them and it was intentional, okay. I don't really care as far as what I'm talking about on this issue right now. Where you come down on that, the fact is they fired a missile and took down an airliner, and it's disappointing that the Trump administration is not talking about, um, you know, cash or payment or how, how, however you do that. And so uh, this is interesting when you that, that that that's kind of died down and I don't think there was any US citizens on there. So I know I know Canada though Trudeau yeah. is um, they had a lot. It, it, yeah, yeah. had a lot of them and they were I think uh Iranian Canadians or Canadian Iranians or however you'd say that. Um and so it's just interesting as you watch this kind of news. I had kind of I had kind of forgotten about that and then I saw that on the weekend I was like, "Oh wow, it's funny that we're we're seeing stuff with Iran, but this isn't part of the narrative and how could this not be at least part of what what the discussions are when you talk about uh, Iran because again I'm not, I'm not much of a sanctions person but so I, I get what you're saying it's, it's not necessarily connected here but it's just interesting that that's not even in the discussion yeah. right now yeah I think they're really concerned about getting Iraq off of Iranian right. gas and these are you know and, and so they finally made movement towards this and it's kind of like a, a reward or, or at least it will be it says that the waiver is supposed to expire February 13th. Mm-hmm. And they want, it says, if Iraq is able to formulate a timeline by the end of the week, detailing a plan to wean itself off of Iranian gas independent dependence. Sorry. So, um, you know, I mean, I think it's a positive sign for Iraq, you know, in terms of the larger picture of, mm-hmm. you know, the, the what's going on between the U.S. and Iran. I think part of the issue is Iran really, like Iran handed Trump that victory when they shot that airliner down. And I get it was a mistake or whatever, but they still did it. And then they tried to cover it up. And they, they, I mean, it's it's like, my God, how lucky does one person get? Like Mm -hmm. Iran handed him this victory. Mm -hmm. Then like the Iowa Democrats handed him another victory. Like, (laughs) come on. I forgot to bring that up. I I went on this podcast last week and I predicted a feel the burn victory. I did not know the world would conspire against me (laughs) and Bernie to hold the man out of it. Do we actually know, like we looked this morning there's no actual winner yet, right? Yeah, There's, like he and Buttigieg seem to be tied-ish, ish. but Bernie says he wants it tied-ish, I think. Mm-hmm. But there's like all this weird stuff about, so like, oh my God, so these caucuses, so now there's this debate over whether like, should we even have caucuses ever? Mm-hmm. Or are they like, oh, true expression of American democracy? Because I talked to some people who are in, I don't know if I said this in the last podcast, but I talked to a, a friend of mine who has relatives who live in Iowa. And it's like a thing, like you go, go to caucus and you're like like i'm with you know i'm caucusing for so and so like let me tell you about how great the mm-hmm. next person mm-hmm. is and like come to my side which is like kind of a really great way to have people engage with democracy because like i mean i'm i'm not registered with the political party so in florida you can't vote in a primary unless you're 
registered by a certain point mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. a political party. Mm-hmm. But in previous lives, when I've lived in different states, I have voted in primaries and it's like a total like letdown. Like you go, you vote and you leave and like you don't talk to anyone and nobody <laughs> talks to you except to like give you a sticker and right. like so you put you're that on like, Twitter. You gotta have your, your Twitter sticker. Yeah, exactly. Like you know Twitter's like, I I voted for so and so and you know, it's so it's like kind of so like caucusing kind of seems like a cool way to have a bit of direct style democracy. Yeah. Anyway, that's no, my like, I, I, I do sense. think that there's something about them the, the talking and the engaging in the process for folks who haven't really followed along is valuable. The the way the process works itself out, I'm a big fan of. But I, I am a I don't know I don't know why I'm in Texas. I think I am a registered Republican. I don't know, but I am a I'm an official member. I'm an official member of the Libertarian Party nationally. So I don't Ooh. know. Yeah, I'm got a, the bumper sticker and everything. I got the bumper sticker and everything. So I don't know. Uh. I, I don't know. I, I I don't know what I would have registered when I moved to Texas. I've been here about three years. I don't know what options they gave me. So but um so but I'm not voting in the primary, so it doesn't doesn't really matter here in Texas. But um. <laughs> And it, you know, I just I just say it was disappointing. I made a prediction on this podcast. I felt confident, and then you know the caucus conspired against me. The most yeah. depressing thing about the caucus was they were they and kept, the app, by the way, and the app, and the app. It's, it's not it was, just the caucus; it was it's just the like app. the House of Cards deal, where they have the app and the app, and they're hacking the app and whatever. Uh, House of Cards is real, nice. <laughs> but anyways. Um, so the most depressing thing about the caucus when we move on was. They go to this, uh, you know, one of these little centers, and there's this guy with a Joe Biden shirt on or a sign on, and this is on CNN. And, um, and so I don't know who the CNN reporter was. He goes, uh, uh, sir, you know, you're, you're standing over here, but uh, you don't have – they have a term, the substantial number. Or they have some kind of term they use to – Yeah, uh, uh, relative, viable. Viable, viable. Yes. You're not, You don't have the viable number. Um, um, and so what are you going to do now? And he's like, <clears throat> well, we're going we're gonna to stand here for Joe Biden because we believe in Joe Biden. And he goes – well, right, but you're not viable. And he goes, "Well, look, this is the uh, the, the the caucusing guy." He goes, "Well, look, uh, I really believe that Joe Biden is a lot of people's second candidate, and so when these other groups break up, we'll get some folks." And I was like, "Like, did you? Like, <laughs> he's he's people's second guy." <laughs> So your your guy is everyone else's second guy, like, and you're like, betting on everyone hating each other so much. That I mean, can decide it's on a totally new way to look at. Like, I, I mean, it's yeah, it's, not, it's really not it's that a totally new. Different way. It's not that new because in high school I felt that like, hey, uh, girl, do you want to go to the prom? No, wait, Tommy's <gasps> taken. Yes, so <laughs> I've been there. You know, what, you know what? You know what it's like. It reminds me of um, matching for residencies. Yeah. So like. It's like everyone, but they do it with a computer. So everyone like ranks like residents, the people who are going to graduate rank the residency programs that they want mm-hmm. in order. Mm-hmm. And then the programs rank the people they want in order. And the machine tries to like find <laughs> matches. So like you could end up getting like your third choice. Right, right. And someone else could get their third choice right. too. You know, it's so, like, anyway. Yeah. I just well, well, wait, the uh, at the end of the show, you need to make a prediction for New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Yeah, well, because, yeah, well, my predictions will cause and chaos. Then, and then we want Nevada, too. Like, Nevada. You, you're, we're, yeah. I think, yeah. <laughs> Which I, is a caucus state. Uh, who is it? I didn't realize that. Ooh, yeah, Nevada okay. caucus. Yeah, there will be Hopefully chaos. Hopefully they did not use shadow, shadow ink either. <laughs> caucus chaos. So, all right, well, I'll make my prediction at the end. Let's get uh, to this. Sergio Chapa, a personal friend of mine, a guy yeah. pretty well, one of the best reporters. If you're a listener and you aren't familiar with Sergio's work, we always make fun of reporters. He does a really good job of being uh, kind of just reporting on what's said. It's, it's, it's amazing how easy it is, or he makes it look. I don't know. But um, so this was at NAPE, I believe, last week where I was at. I didn't go to the speech, but uh, I was there at NAPE. Got to see some folks down there, so that was fun. But here's the headline. Parsley Energy CEO debuts Shell New Deal in appeal to Generation Z. You know... <laughs> how many I mean, How many buzzwords can you use in one... It's like... One... I mean... Article. The New Deal term right now, is, with the Green New Deal, like, I don't think oil and gas should be using New Deal until that kind of whole yeah. Green New Deal kind of goes away, because that's still talked about regularly, so... Parsley, if you want some branding advice, call Ellen up, call Ryan up, we'll help you out. But um, yeah. it seems like, you know, hey, uh, we're going to have this Shell New Deal to counteract the Green New Deal. It's like, that's, yeah, I think that this sounds kind of corny to personally. 
the, the biggest problem is also that apparently people will totally misunderstand the origin of the term New Deal. Mm-hmm. So we all think about the New Deal as like FDR's New Deal and mm-hmm. all the legislation and the changes to the American like government and all of that. But really, when he was talking about it, he meant like a New Deal like cards. <laughs> like, you don't like your hand, we're going to give you a New Deal. You know what I mean? But so like now... Yeah, take two. Yeah, like this. So, so now we're like so far removed from that. It's like a new deal for this, a new deal for that. Yeah. Also, what's Generation Z? Here it says those born between 1997 and 2012. Maybe they shouldn't have I'm used not a slang Generation term from Z. 75 years ago then. Yeah, so two, 2000 and what does it say? 97? 97. 1997 yeah. so and 2012. Right, yeah. now 23, 22, 23, they're, how many birthday yeah, is? Yeah, they're in their 20s. We're all the way to seven teens. years old. Yep. All the way down. So. <laughs> them seven year old, them seven year olds are really seven, important. They're really right. about the, the shale New Deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh gracious. Anyway, so what? So apparently, the shale New Deal is supposed is 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 supposed to it said he says that the oil and gas industry could turn the tide by tackling three issues: perception, pollution, and, and profits. profits. How dare the they? Three P's. They don't make any profits. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Turning the perception would be to make a profit. That would be the thing, right? There you go. You should you should look kindly on this because they're basically doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. They're not making a profit. They're providing you with with clean electricity, mm. cleanish, clean cleaner, cleanish electricity. You know, really cheap natural gas for no profit like what could be better i mean they're basically bernie bros they're, right they, yeah this is they're basically yes. socialists because so, there's yeah. no profit well they're non-profits they're like the red cross on steroids <laughs> <laughs> except they pay taxes they pay, yeah kind of, well depends on the day sure but yeah yeah i, I, I saw that it's like okay so the shell new deal it's like you know it's so funny because if you depend on which publication you turn on or show you know shale is either the the worst thing in the world because they're killing the environment or the, the they're the worst investment in the world because they can't make a buck like, <laughs> so it's like when you you know can't win. you got a lot of you, you know it's like hitler in world war ii you're fighting multiple battles on multiple fronts it is a yep. it is a tough road to and, hope. Yet, and yet he's and yet and yet they're beloved by the political class, or at mm-hmm. least part of the political class, who wants to go and say, you know, we're energy independent every two seconds. So, you know, like, how can we be energy independent or at least energy secure? Because we all know energy independence is not a real thing um, if we don't have all these shell companies making no profits, but oh, yet gracious. producing energy. Oh, gracious. Sharon Wilson is quoted in this piece. Okay. Okay. I don't know Sharon. I see her on Twitter all the time. I'm going to give Sergio a hard time. So I think it's like at Texas Sharon or something like that. You can find her. If you go to Sergio's timeline, anything he puts out about oil and gas, she's there. Uh, oil and gas, okay. this is the quote, oil and gas has been making the same promises to clean up its act since 2005. Yet 15 years later, it's, wor- it's still worsening the climate crisis and plaguing the health of residents next door. Said uh, Wilson with Earthworks, da da da. Um, she goes, Someone should tell its CEO that they don't have a perception problem. Parsley Energy has a pollution problem. It's like, well, wait, one of the, one <laughs> but, of the three, one but of the they three, said they had a pollution one of the three problem. P's is pollution. One of the three P's is pollution. <laughs> like, how many more P's do we need to put out there? Policy, perception, pollution. Um, yeah, so Texas Sharon. So Texas plants. Sharon. Plants. Oh, Texas Sharon. So Texas. Plants. Yeah, so her deal is she goes around. This is her. Um, and Texas Sharon, if you want to come on, we'll be super nice to you. Love to have you on. So, but yes. this is her deal: making methane p- pollution visible, reaching, uh, researching, and reporting damage and climate change from fracking, sacrifice, uh, sa- sa- sacrifice zones. And then she's got her deal. And so, listen, yeah, you know, we can talk about the methane, the impact of that. But the problem, Texas Sharon, is is that. Um, I was looking at her deal because I got tagged in something, or I saw something she was tagged the other night, and and essentially she said that oh oh there was a um so there was a there was an explosion down here and someone was hurt and or killed or I can't remember which 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 one it was but there were some injuries and she said you know we got to get off oil and gas now and I was like well okay uh okay now like now now from now on I'm giving the I'm going to give the answer whenever anyone says I'm giving that answer from that that guy at Oxford who said yes, yes. I can turn off the gas heat to your building now now right now. well the the irony is is that her picture on her Twitter profile is her 
leaning over her car, holding a camera. All of that comes from oil and gas. It's like, well, I, I don't know which. I mean, are you going to walk out there and you know spot the methane using your secret vision? Like, I, I don't know. How could you detect these problems without oil and gas? And so I, it's stuff like that. It's like, okay, we can have a discussion. But, you know, anyways, so <laughs> Texas Sharon. So she's a, well, uh, she's an interesting character. Do not go be mean to her on oh. Twitter. Do not go be mean to her on Twitter. No, no, so no. Do, I, I won't. No, 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 not I'm you. I'm not mean to anyone. <clears throat> no, no, no. I'm not talking about you. I don't want some oh, listener going, going, oh, they were making fun of you. No, she's free to come on and no, have no. her opinion. No, no, everyone, everyone, give her a follow. Yeah. Yep. For so you can, follow Follow Tuesday. Fo- yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And uh, you can find out more about what she thinks about um, stuff and, mm-hmm. and go on. So anyway, she's welcome to Texas Sharon if you're listening. You're welcome to come on. We'll hear you out, but you do have to answer how you are driving around without fossil fuels. But that's Can I also also add one thing that Earthworks was the name of this really cute jewelry store that I used to go to when I was a kid. Hmm. So hmm. That's they've, what they've I grown think really about to a it. Multinational anti oil and gas organization. You yeah, never, environmental you, group. Yeah, you never, you, well, an, an environmental group. Yeah, you never quite know. So, okay, let's go on now to Platts. Plains sees Permian oil output growth slowing by 400,000 barrels a day by year's end. Now, this piece for perspective came out on February 5th, and right now we have to keep in perspective. There's a lot of concern about mm-hmm. oil production growth with the coronavirus that is going to end humanity. So, um, Ellen, will Can we also growth? talk about the fact? Oh, yeah. So one of the other things that was interesting was also that. Oh, yeah. So okay. So oil growth slowing to four hundred thousand barrels per by year end. Yeah, I thought this was interesting because um, as the pipeline company. Yep. Right. Planes. Yep. So um, so some interesting other things that have to do with this. So um, apparently. We're still like selling China, or we're still China's still supposed to buy fifty two point four billion dollars worth of energy products from us in the ne- this and in in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one, and we need pipelines. Oh, is there breaking news on this? Uh, yes, I saw. Ooh. And uh, Nate, we need to reach out to the Bush China people for a comment here. I saw the I think it's the South China Morning Post said that there is an exception clause for like catastrophic. Oh, like acts of God. Yeah, something like yeah. that, that that would get them out of that. This is like an – oh, my God. Now, this that, is like an I, act of God, I, isn't it? Yes. So we will – don't don't run with that. I think I saw, I saw that on a headline. I meant to go follow back up. I did not, but I'm pretty sure um, I saw that. And so we'll get the Bush China people to give us a quote, and we'll come back to you uh, next week Ooh. on that. Uh, tw- we'll tweet it oh, out. Yeah. Ellen and I will tweet it out and let you know. But, um, but yeah, I did see that. And so um, I'm not sure if they are obligated under – um, under the terms of the coronavirus yeah. now. They're, yeah, usually in like contracts you have something like, you know, like barring acts of God and right. like, you know, well, like this, <laughs> wow. Okay, so that's interesting then. Um, anyway, I think it's, um, I mean, how, what, I remember like way back when we were constantly talking about the pipeline situation mm-hmm. in the Permian and the bottlenecks mm-hmm. and, and so so what's what's the situation like we're, now because we've got pipe for days <laughs> you've got plenty of pipe we've got pipe yeah that's not the problem we've got yeah. no pipelines aren't the problem now it's um, you know it's interesting because when the pipelines are, are full what happens is is the pipeline companies obviously charge you more to transport their their product and then when you hit um, you have spare capacity then they can't charge as much and so um, there was a thought process coming into this year that producers could get lower rates to transport their crude, which would increase their bottom line because they're not paying as much, right? Um, and that could incentivize uh, more drilling because the margins would be would be better. Ah, that was one of the, the, the thoughts that was out there. We're, we'll still wait to see. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm I, I won't say names, but I can say I've talked to some companies that people know the names of Ellen. I've told you these names. You know these names. And so these are names that people would hear and go, oh, I've heard those names. And those companies, a small percentage, obviously they're not the everyone, but they're not talking about slowing down, at least before the coronavirus outbreak. So, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know. The other thing is when, when you talk about the production may drop off by 400,000 barrel, uh, 400, barrels a day by the end of the year, I, I guess – the rigs, I hadn't looked at the rig count. I think the rig count grew by one, but I hadn't looked at it much this year. But the rigs were either leveled off or were slowing off. Um, 
at some point the production does have to plateau. And when the production plateaus, the ducks will do whatever the ducks are going to do. But it is... It kind of feels like at some point this thing has to turn over and the inventory starts drawing. And when the inventory draws, the barrels will come back online, right? You would think? I mean, yeah, so I'm, not, yeah. I'm, I'm not a supply and demand expert, but I'm saying, you know, so maybe maybe Plains is right. Maybe they're not right. I don't know. They, they probably have some con- contractual obligations that they can kind of look at and say, well, um, the producers that we're working for have this kind of, you know, these guarantees and, um, you know, we can't get anything beyond that, but I guess I'm a little bit hesitant to say that um, that the price is going to stay low all year. I think the coronavirus thing will come and go. I think you will see some inventory draws. We can't talk about OPEC yet. I'm curious your thoughts on OPEC last week. Um, and uh, Russia. What is Russia going to do? The bromance. Russia. And, uh, but, you know, if, if the OPEC does, is... it's on the rocks. It's on the rocks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, but if OPEC does do another 600,000 barrels a day, uh, of course, you got the Kuwait field coming back online. There's just, there's just too, it's just too, too many things. I love, I'm going to give you a little, little inside baseball here. I love texting the LN of the Roth line. I'm like, so what do you think about this or this? <laughs> because there's just so many factors that go into this stuff. It's like, oh, good Lord. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's Libya. Like we can talk about Libya. Yeah. Yeah. Libya is still offline. Libya says they made zero dollars off of oil wow. in January. That's that crazy. could like kill the entire government. I that's mean, come crazy. on. Like that that's the only thing that they do there. Mm. Essentially. I mean, I don't mean that in like a nasty way. I just no, right, that's right, really right, that's right. their their only export. Sure. So yeah. So we got Libya offline, that's like eight hundred thousand barrels per day. We've got Saudi Arabia saying, please, let's all cut together 600,000 barrels per day. And then Russia's like, I don't think so. We need to Maybe. analyze the market some more. I love Market's that close. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we got to analyze it a analyze. little bit more. <laughs> After three yeah, days of gonna... analysts coming through, like, mm, we, need to, yeah. we need to double check these we, numbers. We need more. The rest, yeah. Then, and then I'll tell you, you've got, you get this great news. Oh, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait are going to restart production on their neutral. Like, Really? Is, that's not what like really that's like the first thing to go come so, on yeah like do we i don't know if we have a do we have a story on that specifically um no but we should just talk about yeah, it yeah so let's talk about let's that because just, that's been down for what two or three years no it's been since 2014 or 2015 it's wild. Been a while right and so they came to an agreement in december this is a field that's co-owned co-managed however you want to say that between the, the saudis yeah. and kuwait um, they came to agreement in December to bring this back online. Theoretically, it could produce as much as 500,000 barrels a day, I believe. Um, and the way the, the article that I read about it, this is what I want your opinion on, it said that, well, they're going to start with like 10,000 barrels a day. Um, but it felt like they were having to start it because they couldn't get the the, 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 the deal done last week. And so I was like, well, hold on. The way, the, the way this article was, was written was like, okay, well, they're going to have to do it now because they couldn't get the deal done. I was like, well, if they had gotten the deal done, they would have just not counted those 500,000 barrels that weren't actually coming on the market. Like, is that what you're, yeah. is that what you're saying? Like, we're cutting 600,000 barrels, 500,000 from this, this, that, uh, this field that we're actually not going to start back up. That's not, that's not yeah. cutting anything. <laughs> like, <laughs> nothing's been cut there. Those are... I think that's what we call paper barrels. Paper barrels. <laughs> they're I'm barrels not, on paper. I'm not saying that's what was going to happen, but the way the article, I was like, wait, hold on. Are you saying that they were going to cut these barrels? Because these barrels don't oh, even yeah. exist. So yeah, help so, us out okay. and understand. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, you've basically got the, new, the neutral zone issue is like a huge issue. But part of the reason, at least that I've heard that there was, I mean, they've been, been you know, at odds with Kuwait for years. Right now, there are two there are two fields. There's an onshore field and there's an offshore field. And at least one of those fields is basically, like, managed by Chevron. And Chevron is all like, yeah, we're ready to go. Whenever you're ready, yeah. just give us sure. a word and we're ready to go. And the other one is like, uh, it's not ready to go. It's, like, needs work. Okay. So, fine. So, they're not going to get back to, like full capacity within like three months but chevron thinks that like their field I th- i'm pretty sure chevron thinks that their fields can can get back up pretty quickly so a lot of or a lot of some people have said that one of the reasons that this deal with kuwait got done finally was because uh saudi arabia wants to pump more from there because it's still dealing with um capacity issues from the upcake attacks well, that makes sense. I'm, I'm not surprised, you know, that they, they, you know, maybe 
for whatever reason, they want to do that. Okay, fine. That's great that it pushed the two of them to like work out the differences and whatnot. But like, could you think of a worse time to restart production than like now? Yeah, that'd be like Venezuela saying, time, "Hey, we've, we've got it figured out. We're, we're we're ready to rock and roll again." We're like, oh, yeah, but like once that. you finally got things worked out between them, and said it was like, "Hey, we'd rather put these barrels on the market so we can you know deal with this other stuff that we got going on." I, I get it. I get the issue, but um, it certainly didn't look good. That headline did not look good for them. No. Like coming out like one day after OPEC. It's like, we need to cut this much. So, and and now it's funny. We're seeing all these like Azerbaijan in favor of cuts. Bahrain in favor of cuts. Like what? Like this is going to pressure Russia? Mm-hmm. Right. Russia, Russia don't take pressure. Russia don't take Putin pressure. Who does? Putin wants to do. Yeah, they like fired the whole cabinet three weeks ago or something. So, you know. It's, it's <laughs> Except for Alexander Novak. Except for Novak. So what will... So what's Russia's end game here, Ellen? Let's just get. What do you think there? What is Novak? Yeah, Russia's, when, when Novak texts Russia's, you on WhatsApp at night. What's he? What's he saying, I, Ellen? I need to get this out of this deal. Russia's end game is basically, I think, to do nothing, to change nothing. On the other hand, Russia could be in deep problems because of coronavirus. Like, I. <laughs> huh, okay, so let's talk about this. So I have a piece that's coming out on Bloomberg, um, probably either in time for the open of European markets tomorrow or for US markets tomorrow that basic where I argue that if coronavirus really does a lot of demand destruction for China, that the comp- that the, their countries like Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the UAE are re- are going to have a much bigger problem now than they did back when oil prices were low in 2015 and 2016. Because back in 2015, 2016, those com- countries were all producing f- all out. They were producing as much as they could. And so even though prices were lower, they were still making a lot in revenue because and, right. and to them it was okay. Now they're not making, they're not producing as much. They're not producing all out. They've cut a lot. And so, first of all, their ability to maneuver is less because they're dealing with an issue on the demand side and curbing the supply side doesn't seem to be helping at all. Plus, they've got so – we've so say we get oil prices down in the 40s, like Brent goes down in the 40s, they're going to be – they're going to have a really hard time because Saudi Arabia is not even producing 10 million barrels per day, whereas before it was producing over 11. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of revenue they're leaving on the table. I did some of the calculations. It's like, okay, so here, the, you, every all our listeners get a nice little preview. Okay, so Saudi Arabia exported 6.85 million barrels per day in January. That's according to Tanker Trackers. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Tanker Trackers for this updated data. Say the price of rent drops by $20 a barrel without any increase in production. Aramco will lose $137 million per day. That's four point two billion dollars per month. Say that Just number because again. Because they're exporting, say, yeah. yeah, per day. This, 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 per so day, one hundred and thirty-seven like million dollars per day. Per day. Wow. Or one day. Per diem. That's <laughs> yeah. Per day. But if they were exporting eight million barrels a day, they wouldn't be losing that much. Right. Right. So, like. So and so, Russia is in a similar situation. They just opened. They just put all this this money and effort into a brand new pipeline with China. They send a lot. So I really, I mean, I get that they're trying to like maintain their, you know, power, their maneuverability, their whatever they want to maintain. They don't really want to cut. Fine, we get it. We know you don't want to cut. Right. You don't really have the ability to cut in the winter. But whatever, you're never going to really cut. But they should also wise up to the fact that they could be facing a serious problem. I'm not saying that OPEC is the best way to deal with this because I don't think cutting 600,000 barrels a day is going to help, but you might not want to burn all your bridges, Russia. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because you know we were talking before the coronavirus, like, okay, hey, markets, what are you going to do now? The the trade deal's done, da da da. And yeah. Then now the coronavirus is like, oh, good grief! And then, did you see Sinopec cutting the, the refinery throughputs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, and um, on top of that, we got new bird flu outbreaks. So we oh, got coronavirus good. hitting. The end hitting, is nigh. Uh, the end is nigh. Yeah, we will have oh, a. Yeah. We, okay, 
over or under one month before a celebrity comes out and says that this is the world telling us we shouldn't reelect Donald Trump? Well, <laughs> Will it oh, happen before I a month think, or not? Are we, are, we're already <laughs> didn't, didn't someone give that in an Oscar speech last night? <laughs> I didn't hear it. Oh wait, so that was know. the veganism that speech. That was the veganism speech. I didn't I didn't hear it. I saw okay. Brad Pitt made some comments, but I don't I don't listen to them. Oh, so. you missed later at like the in the night when Joaquin Phoenix won Best Actor for the Joker. Mm. It was like incomprehensible, but all I could get about that is like he doesn't like that cows are artificially inseminated and then we use them for their milk and for their meat. And like, I think the whole thing was a pitch for vegetarianism or veganism, but I couldn't quite be sure. Let me just, can I just get a 30 second rant here? You pompous, (laughs) arrogant, bleep it out, Nate, holes that sit there and have swanky bags that are worth like a quarter million dollars because you could act like a freaking imbecile or a person or whatever in a movie. I don't give two rips what you think on anything because you have the IQ less than my nine-month-old child because you were flying around the world. Like Mark Ruffalo the other day was over in the uh, European Union like, do not use uh, US LNG. Like, bro, how did you get there? Like, let's just, yeah. like, how did you get there? So that's my 30 second moron. I just, I just can't take it, Ellen. You, why'd you I, I would respect up? him. I would have respected him a lot more if at the end he was like, and buy this, in, you know, buy this new fake meat company that I've invested in. Like, <laughs> okay. I would totally have just respected saying. him yeah, more just, for that. Yeah. Well, I would have, I would have respected uh, the Hulk if he had gotten a rowboat and a wooden rowboat that he saw by hand and you know, just rowed across mm-hmm. the ocean. I'd be like, hey, row respect. You know, you're, you're, yeah. you're leading by example, but get a life. You're people. living it. You're living your, living your beliefs. Okay. Let's turn. Oh, okay. Let's speaking of protesters. From the Financial Post, <laughs> why pipeline protests in Canada have taken an ugly turn and could disrupt the wider economy at the worst possible time. <laughs> Filed under stuff you need to know. And I think that's, uh, well, that could be stuff you need to know. Ellen, we've talked about this. There was a, I think it was you that was showing uh, a derailment the other day uh, up to our oh, friends yeah. in the north. Well, in Saskatch- Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. And um, yeah, if you don't want pipelines, that's fine. But the alternative is actually worse, not better yes. so just 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 keep that in mind but what is going on with our favorite with our friends to the north our friends to the north who live by the way in provinces, provinces not states not states not yes. states not states yes. not that we, never we shall never conf- we shall never confuse the two again mostly because <laughs> we don't want hate mail um okay yeah so um i really like the stuff that the this guy who write who works for financial post uh yadala hussein puts together so Shout out to him for always having good stuff on the Canadian Financial Post. Anyway, very important. Okay, so um, this um, so there's these protesters who are opposed to the coastal gas pipeline in British Columbia um, are protesting this. This is a gas project that's going to link Canadian natural gas resources to a four hundred billion dollar export liquefied natural gas project. I don't know if that's Canadian dollars or American dollars, but. It's big, no matter what. So they want to export LNG, and they need this gas project, and these people are uh, protesting. Then, uh, apparently, it's all about protests. Uh, They're also going to have a protest. um, Oh, a Canadian guy is going to appear in court in Houston, British Columbia, because he faced criminal charges after he was arrested last year on Wet'suwet'en territory for protesting the coastal gas link pipeline. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. So there, um, I'm, you know, you've got a lot of these protests, people in Canada want pipelines and yet the oil and gas products are being transported in ways that are not safe. And they're the ones who are going to be at risk. Yes. Pipelines do have problems. Mm. So does everything. Everything has problems. Literally everything everything that that we do. Everything that we do. Like like everything that man builds can break. That's just the way it is. Breaking news by Ellen Wald. We haven't brought out the we haven't brought out the Ellen Wald breaking news indicator in a long time. But that deserves it right there because breaking news, yeah. (laughs) Hashtag breaking news. But pipelines are just way more they're way safer than cars and trains. It just is. But it's interesting because Canada is really in the absence of the Keystone XL pipeline, which still hasn't happened. Um, you know, you, Canada has really been looking to ship stuff 
to uh, to the east. And they've had a lot of their own problems with the Trans Mountain Pipeline and, and all this other stuff. And um, But now it's interesting because I, I wonder if this coronavirus issue is going to give more feed to people who don't want to see these pipelines built because they'll say, oh, well, they're all, you know, dying of coronavirus. So, like, <laughs> your projects aren't going to amount right. to anything. Right. Um, I don't know, but it's it's interesting, and it's also it also seems like this cult, like these protests for pipelines have grown into this kind of like a culture of pipeline protest. Yeah, and it like has. celebrities get on it. Like um, Shailene Woodley was like really into the one the the big protest that was up in like Montana or something. Mm. You know, like sleeping out there mm-hmm. and everything. And it's it's I think it's become a thing. Oh, it it definitely has become a thing, and it's a thing that's you know I. I, I think we need to get our hero on. We need to have the Energy Week Medal of Honor, and we need to give it to that gentleman from uh, the college or wherever. Because oh yeah, Oxford. Yeah, yeah. I mean, d- he deserves he, it. He deserves it. The Energy Week Medal of Honor and um, Medal of Medal Medal of Energy and Freedom or something like that. Or uh, yeah, the there C- we go. The CO two Medal of Freedom. But anyways, um, we- <laughs> <laughs> this medal has been constructed in. Entirely from plastic, <laughs> but no, I, I, you're, you're you're right about that. It is it is it is a thing where you you are seeing this that uh, we see it here in Texas. It was in the what was the 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 ETC line up North Dakota. Um, you're not. Yeah, you're not. <laughs> I know like, what you mean. You're like, yeah, that one. That one. Uh, oh, the gosh, dog. Anyways, um, the Keystone Pipeline, all those the Dapple, Dakota Express Pipeline, or whatever it's called. Anyways. Um, to go to access, anyways, that's going to drive me crazy. But yeah, you know, all you, it is a thing, and those protesters are there, and it, it catches a lot of mo- momentum. And you know, when you go back to what the parsley guy was talking about, we're kind of poking at with the with the Shell New Deal. The oil and gas industry has done a terrible job of educating the public, and they are they are reaping what they've sown as far as far as that's going with saying, hey, the pipelines are safe, they're effective. Obviously, like you said, they're not 100. They're going to break. They're going to tear up. Okay, but we we get that. But um, but they've done a poor job, and, and they're kind of eating, um, you know, having to do with all these difficulties because they they haven't educated the public. They haven't spent a lot of time um, talking about all the benefits that they do. And, and so now it's, I'm not surprised. And of course, when the celebrities get involved, what do you expect? Dakota Access Dakota Pipeline. Access. There it is. Thank you, Nate. Producer. Yeah, Nate. that comes from Nate. Nate. Nate the Great Hanson. Thank you, Nate. Dakota Access Pipeline. I said Dapple. Yes, that, was I close. Uh, yep. that was close. You got All the right. Dapple part right. You got the it. The Dapple. The Dapple. So, okay, let's go to investing.com where the smartest person I know, Dr. Ellen Wald, has penned a piece. What's next for the U.S. oil market and energy policy? Ellen, you're tackling all that yeah. in 600 words? Impressive. Yeah, I thought we should. <laughs> yeah, I thought we should talk about the State of the Union, um, and the you know the what what the president had to say about the State of the Union uh, in terms of energy. Are we going to start with and the handshake? So that's what I wrote about the no handshake, the tearing of the State of the Union. We, 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 oh my God! I don't think it has anything <laughs> much. To, you know, that's just a that's, that's a bad sign for oil prices. Well, how there dare she? Does, did, did she recycle that paper? It big that is you know it was it did seem to be printed double side mm. which I thought was was yeah, showing very uh, good you know yeah. we like the trees yeah. we don't also good because like you know less paper less, use yeah, you know yeah. like money for taxpayers mm-hmm. like yeah, yeah. Very I'm, I'm cool with the double sided yeah <laughs> I, I applaud you double sided person who printed it double sided <laughs> but anyway here's what I thought he said or didn't say okay so yes this phase one trade deal is like all big question marks now but so obviously the president touted energy independence which we all know is not true um but does resonate with voters especially those who are not really thinking about what that means sure so um you know we know that we're the largest solar producer in the world today um but i thought it was notable that President Trump did not mention any new initiatives that his administration had planned to boost U.S. energy production or even spur output, energy output of any type. In previous speeches, he's talked all about you know U.S. energy of all kinds, oil mm-hmm. and natural mm-hmm. gas and mm-hmm. coal and nuclear and, and all that. And he really didn't didn't mention it. Didn't mention any plans to increase production. Um, it could be that that got axed for time, mm-hmm. but it could be a sign that president is satisfied i don't know i think it's an interesting thing to consider that that you know all the other things that he mentioned he talked about new initiatives and he didn't really mention any new uh initiatives so uh it could be he doesn't think we need it um or 
I think I he's got to be careful, to be honest with you. I mean, a large part of his base is oil and gas workers, and they're not very happy with prices right now. So if you talk about increasing production and they're like, wait, hold on, or, or who's going to buy them barrels? That's not a that's not a good spot. And, you know, uh, so he likes – I think Trump likes the prices of where they're at now. And you couple that with his base probably isn't overly thrilled, or at least a portion of his base isn't overly thrilled. Him touting more production would probably be yeah. a dangerous move. So that's a good. I like that analysis. Um, so, so yeah, and, and then I just noted some of the issues in terms of infrastructure that, mm-hmm. um, at least according to what um, Dr. Foreman said, that um, the U.S. isn't really prepared in terms of infrastructure to export massive amounts of energy products to China. Although now we've seen that we, we may have a breather on that one. We'll mm-hmm. have to mm-hmm. have to confirm that. But um, I think. I think that the energy secretary, the new energy secretary, needs to provide some guidance, at least to traders and also to, um, you know, to energy companies about what a, what, if there are another four years of the Trump administration, what that will mean for energy and and what's his plan. Um, I know they talked about something about like coal, like coal research, was just unveiled. I'm not really sure what what we're researching about coal, <laughs> but yeah, you know, David Blackman uh, a while back now, maybe a year or two years ago, he he talked about some of the regulatory things that the Trump administration was going to do, and that they'd basically done a lot of it very early on in the administration. So I also wonder if he's kind of got those W's, if you will, and there's not really much on a deregulatory standpoint that he's he's looking to do. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting because the prices. You know, if the prices do go, if you said Brent goes down to 40, if Brent goes down to 40 and is in the 40s uh, come election season, feel the burn. <sighs> Let me tell you something. Feel the burn. Yeah. Uh, a, a Bernie Sanders or Warren candidate. We're talking about this in the podcast this morning. Could you, know, you think about it. If Bernie or Warren, those are the two notables that I can think of that who sit there and ban fracking. If they win the, the primary and get the nomination and they go into the first debate and Trump calls them out on ban and fracking and they say they're going to do it still, they, they double down then, um, that would actually boost prices <laughs> if, if it's a competitive mm-hmm. race. Because you think about it, if, if, the, if the pollsters are thinking, well, Byrne or, or, or Warren actually have a shot at winning, um, and they're talking about banning fracking, the prices would actually go up because people would be afraid that, that they would be banned, right? So it, it would almost... Yep. It almost... Oh, yeah. It would actually help them. <laughs> <It> actually... <laughs> How crazy is that? <laughs> I know, I know. Um, yeah. So I wanted to address. I got some interesting questions on this article. Yeah, I, I was think actually. Our listeners I'll might be. Read this yeah, down okay, here, so yeah. some of the questions are. Yeah, some of the comments are totally mm-hmm. bizarre. Mm-hmm. But one of them was interesting. The person actually reached out to me on Twitter, and I did want to address some of this. Um, so he had three questions. He said, "Will Saudi Arabia get annoyed if the U.S. starts exporting oil to Asia, especially China? What could Saudi Arabia do about this? And could Saudi Arabia, in his words, go nuclear by pricing oil and currencies other than dollars?" And so. My answer is that Saudi Arabia is actually in the best position vis-a-vis China because they have long-term contracts with Asian producers. So oil from the U.S. is very unlikely to decrease what Saudi Arabia sells to China because that's, you know, and, and, and Aramco is part owner in these refineries. And, and that's one of the reasons why they do it to ensure, uh, you know, a, a, an outlet for their crude. Um, also, it's business. You don't get annoyed at your competitor because they also made a sale. Like you just don't do that. I, I don't think Saudi Arabia yeah. can be like, Oh, how dare you us? You get, you're breaking into our market. It's not, it's not like that. Um, well, either the, either but, the blends of the oil matter or they don't. Right. And, and so, I, I, yeah, they do, but it's not like, I, I don't think that Saudi Arabia will see this, see the U S as a threat in any way. Well, I'm also, saying, I don't, I was just say that the Saudis are producing a certain blend, a certain grade, and we're producing a different grade. And you, you, you got to blend these percentages. Then we could only, you can only cut away from them from such a percentage, right? So if they're putting something heavy, yeah. maybe something light, and you need a ninety ten ratio or whatever it is of the heavy to light, well, you can only sell. The, you're not going to. We can't export the same type of oil that they can export. Right? We can't. They can export all the types of oil, and okay. I'm sure they do sell a lot of light oil to, to China. So they could be upset if our light oil eats into their light oil. But my point is they have long-term contracts. Okay, so okay. like 
so the China is not going to like cancel on them. Okay, so they, they so have they a wider import. range of blends of, uh, of grades that they can they can export. Oh yeah. Okay, I knew they had that. Oh, yeah. I didn't know they had the the full spectrum. Oh yeah, they oh, okay. they've they've got oh just about everything. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, but the other thing is that there's nothing like Saudi Arabia cannot, no matter what they say they will do, they cannot price their oil in anything other than dollars. Hmm. they first of all. Their cur- the real is tied to the it's pegged to the dollar, mm-hmm. and unpegging it would be disastrous for their economy. Um, so they're not going to unpeg their their currency. Okay. Also, like Aramco operates in dollars, like the whole company operates in dollars. They right. pay their taxes to the Saudi government in dollars. They pay their royalties and go- they pay everything in dollars. So this would be a major restructuring of their entire business practice. Hmm. So I don't think they can really do anything. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to pull up their... No, that's a good question. No, it is a good question. Very I'm trying to pull up their grades. I didn't realize... They do... Oh, they do air blight. They do like an extra light. They do uh, medium. They do heavy. I don't know. I have a book that like tells me all their different grades. Right, right there? Behind you? That book? Uh, no, that book doesn't. <laughs> it's a different book. But you haven't plugged that it's book in a while, so it's probably time. That's true. Yeah. Um, buy my book. Lion's book. Book, book audio book. Saudi Inc. Especially because it, by the way, so I, I wrote a piece that doesn't really have to do much with oil, a little bit with oil, but basically argues that the U.S. and Saudi Arabia aren't allies and they haven't been. That. And people saying that, that, that they were allies have basically been promoting their particular interests. Mm -hmm. Apparently, this is like a really big sore spot for a lot of people, including, by the way, the former ambassador to Bahrain from the United States. Really? Apparently, he was very personally offended. Or at least he took out his... He he, he attacked me personally. (laughs) So I assume that there was some sort of personal offense there in order to provoke such a personal attack on me as a person. Why was he personally Um, offended? Uh, see that I don't know, um, but yeah, I, I we could read some of these because they're kind of funny. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I got I got some very interesting responses. Also, some very creative gifts. Like there was one of Kanye West. There was one of President Trump pretending to shoot a rifle. Um, you know, very mm-hmm. creative guys. But um, I got a lot of like of people saying like I hate Saudi Arabia. I'm spreading hate. And I want to be. I want, I want to kind of like reiterate. Like I wrote a whole book about how business savvy the Saudis are and how they basically conned the Americans out of a lot of money and basically out of entire oil company. Mm. So yeah, I'm not really sure what this like spreading hate business is. Yeah, how dare you? Okay, we are up against the clock. We had one more piece, but Ooh. we are. It's fine. We're up against the clock. My official prediction. You know, I, I predicted Byrne would win. Uh, the first two primaries, and so despite the overlords of the Democratic Party ruining his campaign, I will stick with my prediction that he will win New Hampshire tonight, and uh, then from there, I, I think I put on Twitter, it's uh, he won the first two, but it won't win the primary, uh, or it won't win the nomination is what I yeah, is what I All put right. out there. So, so there it is. Um, second place, because in, in the Democrat primaries, second place actually does matter. Who do you think will come in second? Will it be Warren? I think Warren's got to. I think if she struggles here, it's it's bad news for her, right? It's toast. Yeah. yeah. If she so. struggles, in, she, I mean, Massachusetts is her base, right. and this is New Hampshire is full of either ex Massachusetts Massachusettsians. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, man, but yeah. it's not looking good for her. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're setting it up for a nice Bloomberg Biden showdown <laughs> somehow. I don't know. How. Oh, I, I turned it on. Uh, you know what? I'll tell you offline. Uh, people get mad. <laughs> so, anyways, thank you for tuning in. Ellen will be at Bloomberg, investing.com, Forbes. I'll yeah, be at the usual spots. And, um, also, I was on the Wall Street Journal Energy Journal interview today, which oh, was really yeah. cool. It's like an email, so I, I'll put that link in. Um, it was a really fun interview with David Hodari, who's awesome. So thanks, guys. All right, listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back next week.